for those people who are less familiar with the concept of strain, I think a good analogy here is, is like breeds of dog. You know, all dogs are Canis familiaris. They all have certain traits in common, but there are differences, but they're all the same species. Yeah, and with bacteria strains within the same species, we don't have the same physical characteristics that look different, but we know that we can subject them to different exposures and they will react differently. You know, like they can, some, some strains within a certain species will tolerate stomach acid and some won't. Some will tolerate bile, some won't. Some will attach to your gut, some won't. Some will stay in your gut for a few days, some will pass straight through. Um, just to name a few of those sort of basic characteristics that we're often looking for with probiotics and that we already, we've known for a long time, you can go back to research in the 1970s that, that we're looking at, let's isolate, you know, 15 strains of lactose acidophilus and it's exposed them to get stomach acid. And you could see even then that some strains could tolerate those things. Some things did not. Um, I think it was a study in 2010 where they took, you know, I think it was 90 strains of lactose, I think for memory it was fermentum. And they said, okay, let's expose these 90 strains to stomach acid, let's expose them to bile, and let's see how many tolerate both those things well. And I think it was from memory, it was 4% of those starting wow. materials could actually tolerate stomach acid and bile to the point that they could theoretically survive transit to the upper gut. The rest wow. would have all died. Yeah. I think that's one of those clear examples. Um, and there's looking at, at uh, another species, Lactobacillus reuteri. Um, and there's certain strains of lactose reuterin that can produce a, a, an antimicrobial compound called reuterin. And reuterin is, you know, kills, is effective against fungal pathogens, is effective against bacterial pathogens. Um, but we can't assume that all strains produce it because they don't. <laughs> Only some strains do. Even if it has the name lactose reuterin, it does not mean it produces reuterin. Um, and those strains that do not produce reuterin are very unlikely to have the same kind of benefits from a microbiome alteration perspective, um, either against fungal dysbiosis or bacterial dysbiosis as those that produce reuterin. Um, and, the, and the strain that we know, that, that's probably the biggest um, from the research base is, is the one I mentioned before, the DSM-17938, which is in BioGaia, which has got this cool study where they gave it to, um, essentially kids who were taking a proton pump inhibitor, which is a class of medications that probably many of your listeners are familiar with. And gosh, a lot of people take <laughs> in Western nations, it's huge, um, but because it, it suppresses stomach acid output. So it's used to treat reflux disease, essentially. Um, and also peptic ulcer disease, but that's usually a shorter period of time. But for a, d a high proportion of people who take this medication, they develop SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And there's some debate about how much that is, whether it's 50, 60, 70% of these people will develop it, but it's pretty marked anyway. So this study was, was, okay, well, what happens if we give a probiotic alongside the proton pump inhibitor? Will it prevent SIBO from developing? And this is what the study did. They gave a placebo, they gave this particular strain of lactose reuteri, and I think SIBO developed in 56% of those in placebo group versus 6% of wow. those in that probiotic group. And I think what's interesting here is that there's a, another study using a combination of two different probiotic strains at um, maybe 10 or 20 times the dose. Same similar model, let's give it to people taking proton pump inhibitors. It did not work. <laughs> it didn't actually stop people from developing. So it's not something that all probiotics do, but this particular strain we know produces reuterin and reuterin works against fungal and bacterial pathogens and prevented the overgrowth from occurring, which I think is you know, one of, those, one of the things that's pretty amazing and means we just have to make sure that the strains that we're choosing for tax has got the qualities and actions that we're after. Um, one of the few studies that actually directly compared two different strains for the, in the same study um, was for viral gastroenteritis, yeah, which is something that all kids end up getting, um, all of us will often get it from our kids um, is when they bring it home from daycare. So it's immensely common this condition, generally short-lived, but it can result in hospitalizations and dehydration and, and death in kids. And often does still even in Western nations because of the dehydration aspect, even though it's not, you know, directly causes death, it's more indirectly via dehydration. So having treatments that, that shorten the duration and decrease the severity are, are extremely welcome. So in this particular study, they, they compared these two probiotic strains, same species, lactose remnosis, one with L-remnosis GG, one with lactose remnosis lactophilus, um, gave these kids one either of the two, um, and the kids that took the LGG, they got better 24 hours sooner. You know, and 24 hours is big. If you've got a kid that's got vomiting and diarrhea, you will notice 24 hours less of vomiting and diarrhea. 
Yeah. And it also enhanced secretory IgA production, you know, one of the main sort of immune markers, uh, way that your immune system is dealing with, with, you know, pathogens like viruses in the gut. Um, whereas the, the, the other lac that lactophilus rhamnosus did not, you know, so, and this is again, same species, just different strains. And, and there's a lot more examples in terms of other characteristics that we could, we could go into as well, but I think it's, it is very clear if you look at the literature, um, it's definitely not a marketing thing. And I, I hear you because I think there's a lot of practitioners. And I think this is partly because industry promotes that idea. Some in industry do. Generally, the companies that, that are um, using non promoting supplements strains. that don't have research. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> they don't list their strains or they use strains with no research base. Um, so they don't want people to know about the strain specificity. They want to cloud the, the, the um, waters. And they do that effectively. Yeah, and this is something that I've been trying to bust for seriously 20 years. I've been trying to, to, you know, let practitioners, clinicians, and the general public, but mostly I work with training clinicians, um, this information so that they can really see through that, the cloudiness that's being put out there. Because the research is clear if you look, look at it, that yeah. there, there are generally big differences. Now, for certain conditions, it may not matter so much, um, where, you know, maybe the similarities of, of like their capacity of, Bifidobacteria strains produce acetate, you know, and that 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 all all of them probably will share in it within a given species. Although there will still be differences in terms of how much they produce to certain food substrates, but they all produce acetate. For example, that might mean for certain conditions it won't matter as much, and you might put, you know, maybe post antibiotics trying to to help restore a bit of of gut health something maybe it won't matter quite as much, you know, in that case, because maybe just the change in pH, it's all that's required to help in that case. Now, that said, it matters heaps when we're actually giving it alongside the antibiotics, you know, where we know that certain probiotics make no difference. Like there's this cool study that was published in the Lancet, you know, it's huge medical journal um, in terms of, of, of reach and um, um, how high it is from an impact factor perspective. That used, I think it was 60 billion CFU of four different probiotic strains to try to prevent anabolic associated diarrhea. And I think it had like over a thousand patients. It was like a big study. It did not work. Mm. You know, yet we've got other strains where you can give, I'll go back to that lactose reuteride DSM 17938, 200 million CFU. It works to prevent antibiotic associated diarrhea. So we know alongside antibiotic strains definitely do matter, but there will be some applications where I think, you know, probably after antibiotics, where we're just trying to get more, change the pH of the environment to help indigenous populations that we want to support to grow back a bit more quickly may not matter quite as much.